Hello! Now getting to the last video in this chapter, we would just like to give you a brief overview of how analog to digital and digital to analog converters work. These devices will also be covered in detail in chapters 11 and 12. In addition, we will cover the protection of the I.O. ports discussed previously. We want to process signals from our environment in some way with the control unit. If we want to detect that the switch has been turned on, we can use the procedures described earlier. As we have seen, both the on and off states of a switch have a well-defined digital value. However, there are many things that we can no longer deal with so easily, since there cannot be only two well-defined states. For example, consider the measurement of temperature. The mercury of a thermometer can have many values, and it can take any value between two well-defined values. To understand the processes, we need two definitions. First of all, what is an analog signal? An analog signal is nothing more than a representation of a continuous physical quantity, for example temperature, humidity, pressure, and a continuous function of time. Consider mercury thermometers, where its mercury length as an analog signal represents the temperature in such a way that the two quantities vary in proportion to each other. Since this is an electronics course, the most common analog signal is the voltage or current signal, which is a function of time. The measurement of other physical quantities can also be traced back to the measurement of voltage or current in some form. And how would you define the term digital signal? A digital signal is a signal that is not continuous in time and can only take a discrete value. This is known as quantized. A digital signal is usually encoded by numbers, most often in binary form. A digital signal takes a finite number of distinct values at a given instant in time. The figure in the curriculum shows four examples of signals with discrete or continuous values in continuous time or discrete time. Fortunately, we can measure analog signals, such as temperature, with digital instruments. As we have mentioned earlier, digital instruments can only work on well-defined, that is, quantized values. Our task is to convert the analog signals of the world into digital signals that can be easily processed by the controller. The solution is the Analog to Digital Converter, or ADC for short. There are many types of such devices, depending on their accuracy, speed, and the way they work. We don't need to know much about the construction of these converters, just the basics of how they work. The AD converter can convert the incoming signal into a digital signal that the controller can easily handle. The conversion process can be followed as shown in the figure. The input continuous voltage is sampled by the microcontroller at equal intervals, and then the sampled amplitude value is quantized to determine the corresponding digital value. Now that we know that there is a transition from the analog world to the digital, we can wonder if there is a way to reverse the whole process. The good news is that of course there is. Devices that turn a digital value into its analog equivalent are called digital to analog converters, or DACs. These are common and widely used tools. Just to give you an example, it allows us to play sounds or music from our computing devices, and thanks to this, you can hear our voice now. In this chapter, you do not yet need to have a deep knowledge of how the device works. All you need to know is that you can use the controller to input a number or a sequence of numbers to the DA converter, and it will produce an analog voltage corresponding to that on its output. Then, you may even want to use an analog filter stage for the sake of a smooth output signal shape so that the signal should not contain large jumps, step-ups, and downs. The figure can be a bit deceptive because we cannot recover our signal perfectly after filtering. The different sampling and quantization cause distortion in the signal, 
so the restored signal will only be very similar to the initial figure, but not completely identical to it. In order to restore the signal, the Shannon sampling theorem must be taken into account. That is, the sampling frequency must be at least twice the lowest frequency component of the signal. However, proving this is beyond the scope of this chapter. For electronic devices, it is of utmost importance to respect the operating range, otherwise the devices can be easily damaged. For this reason, it is necessary to provide them with various protections to limit the changes in the operating range due to different influences. In our circuits, the biggest problems, including device failure, can be caused by overvoltage and overcurrent. To ensure proper protection, the effects of overvoltage and overcurrent or the phenomena themselves must be controlled. The figure shows a simple protection circuit used at the input ports of microcontrollers. Diodes D1 and D2 are located inside the microcontroller and play a role in surge protection. If the voltage on a leg rises above the sum of the supply voltage and the diode opening voltage, diode D1 opens and limits the input to this sum voltage. In the other case, if the voltage at the input falls below the difference between the earth potential and the diode opening voltage, diode D2 opens and limits the voltage. If the overvoltage is present at the input for a prolonged period of time, the amount of dissipated energy on the diodes increases, the diodes become increasingly hot and eventually burn out. This problem can be solved by inserting a series resistor. The resistor has a current limiting function. Its value must be chosen so that no more current than the maximum allowed current flows through the internal diode at the maximum voltage difference. The same solution can be also used to protect the outputs. In this case, it must be dimensioned in such a way that when the controller output is set to a logic high or low level, and the short circuit to earth or the supply voltage is assumed due to a fault, no current flowing through the output exceeds the value allowed in the datasheet. Protection can be further improved by incorporating a C1 capacitor. The resistor R1 implements an RC filter with capacitor C1. The resistor continues to act as a current limiter, while the capacitor filters high frequency noise. If you don't want to rely on internal diodes for protection, you can use external diodes, preferably Schottky diodes, D3 and D4 in the figure. Schottky diodes are special diodes made from a combination of a metal and a doped silicon wafer. In practice, they have the great advantage of opening faster and having almost half the forward voltage of general purpose diodes. This makes the system redundant and therefore much more reliable. The protraction will work really well if the Schottky diodes are chosen to have a lower forward voltage than the ones inside the controller, in addition to a sufficiently high power rating. The external diodes will open sooner and dissipate excess power, so the internal D1 and D2 diodes will not drive even in the event of a fault. Momentary overvoltage is created by electrostatic discharge, or ESD in short, in devices are also harmful. In such cases, TVS, that is the transient voltage suppression diodes, should be used. Such a diode in the diagram is D5. These devices can quickly cut off large voltage spikes. Further protection is provided by placing a ferrite ring, marked L1, in the figure. It is a coil on an iron core, thus increasing the inductance. This coil increases the rise time of the transient phenomenon, giving the TVS diode even more time to operate. In most cases it is unnecessary and quite expensive to provide this level of protection for all inputs, but there may be some safety critical applications where it is essential. This brings us to the end of chapter 7. In summary, this curriculum had introduced us to the general purpose input and output ports of the microcontroller. 
We have learned about the modes of operation in which we can use these legs and their special settings, such as communication, analog to digital conversion, or even digital to analog conversion. Finally, we learned how to protect our controller from unexpected external influences, such as overvoltage, overcurrent, ESD, or even faulty wiring. I hope that with this knowledge, you are now confident to start implementing your own ideas. Following the practical examples provided, you can develop various applications step by step. We advise you to follow further CCE videos. Bye! Bye.